Hello, everybody. Um, so warehouse and factory robotics have been you know, one of the hotter topics of conversation since we've started this conference. Uh, but it seems that lately construction robotics has really taken off as something that people are really excited about. So I guess maybe starting off, uh, if you guys could kind of enumerate what's exciting and what's hard about this space right now. Sure. So uh, I think what's really exciting is that there's just an, an exponential amount of growth happening in construction overall. You know, urbanization, the renewable energy transition um, is just creating a huge amount of demand for construction. And so I think that that opens up all of these new possibilities for the way that we go about it as well as, as, as needs. And for us in particular, seeing it go in a more manufacturing-centric direction is really interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, totally agree. And I would also add that there's a huge labor shortage in construction right now, um, where there's just not enough people who have the skills that are necessary to build, you know, the new infrastructure that we need um, in order to support, you know, things like climate change and urbanization. So, I think that's giving their, uh, that's creating an opportunity to bring in automation and have it be a tool for workers um, rather than something that challenges workers. And you know, we've seen that being a really pos positive dynamic at Built Robotics. I'm really fascinated by the fact that if you just look around you right now, you spend the vast majority of your time in a building that was built by the construction workforce. And the vast majority of that work is done by people on their hands and knees using their hands. Um, and so it's a huge opportunity for automation. Um, but I think uh, on, the, on the flip side, the challenge is that if you look at a typical construction site, it's chaos. And anyone with a robotics background or who knows anything about robotics knows it's really hard to make robots work in that kind of unstructured environment. So that's both the opportunity and the challenge. Yeah. I think the fact that there even is a construction robotics industry is, is a success um, and is exciting. Um, it's an industry that has notoriously lagged behind in terms of innovation, so we're seeing some real growth. Um, and what's also cool is the diversity of approaches. I mean, even the panelists here, we have four completely different morphologies for robotics. Yeah, I think maybe that's a good place to kind of kick off from. So where do you all kind of fit underneath this banner of construction robotics? We can go down the line again. Sure. So <laughs> at Toggle, um, we're very much in the manufacturing-centric side of things. We're bringing the type of manufacturing automation that you would see in consumer products or automotive to construction materials. And in particular, we're focused on rebar, which is the steel reinforcement for reinforced concrete, mm -hmm. um, which happens to be the most ubiquitous building material. Mm -hmm. And I built what we do is we sort of build these guidance systems uh, or brains that you can then install on off the shelf heavy equipment. So things like excavators and bulldozers, uh, compactors. Um, and the insight there is that it's kind of similar to self driving cars, uh, where you can take advantage of this mechanical platform, which has been developed uh, really over decades, uh, almost a century at this point, and then layer in sensors and software uh, and you know, obviously new machine learning techniques in order to make these machines have new capabilities. Um, and I like that because I come, come at the robotics from more of a software background. So it's let us iterate a lot more quickly. And we can kind of stand on the shoulders of giants and, and be able to leverage you know, the things that Caterpillar and Deere and Komatsu and companies like that have been able to do in the past. Mm -hmm. Uh, Dusty is focused on the, uh, the work that gets done in the field. You know, there's a lot of uh, technology that's entering the construction industry. Most of it happens on the front end in the design part of building a building. Uh, but once it actually starts being time to build the building, it's done by people using their hands. And so we're focusing on actually one of the very early steps in the process. Once the information starts making its way out into the field, uh, today that's uh, the building model, the floor plans are printed on paper and handed to some guy in the field who gets down on his hands and knees and uses a measuring tape to figure out where do you put the walls, where do you install the pipes, how do you install these things that go up overhead. Um, and that today is done by people doing math in their heads. Uh, so we saw that problem and uh, we're solving it by building what we're calling a field printer that can take those building plans, uh, drive around on the concrete surface and automatically mark the locations of everything that's going to go into that building. Yeah, and I work with the Spot quadruped robot at Boston Dynamics, and it was not purpose-built for construction, but what we found is that its kind of unique mobility and autonomy capabilities have made it really successful as a sensor platform, essentially. Um, so we've been approaching the construction industry um, as image sensing 
and we've been finding that we found a lot of early success, um, ranging from both 360 image capture with partners like Hollow Builder um, to the other end of the spectrum with uh, LiDAR uh, site scanning with partners like Faro and Trimble. How do you guys define, when you're talking to customers, the difference between you know, a purpose-built piece of machinery versus a robot? Well, there's the old joke in robotics that as soon as a robot becomes useful, you call it a machine. <laughs> okay. um, and I think the idea there is just that some of the core things that robots do, I mean, I would actually define a robot as a machine that can sense its environment and then make decisions and then actuate in some way, you know, so basically affect its environment in some way. And if you use that rubric, then very simple things are actually robots. Uh, my favorite example is a thermostat. Mm -hmm. So you know, it can sense its temperature. Uh, it can make a decision, you know, should we turn on the burner or not? Mm -hmm. And then it can actuate by turning on some valve or something, which then affects the temperature. Um, and so that's really how we position what builds robots do in the industry. Because when people think robots, it kind of triggers uh, you know, a bunch of scary thoughts. Like people think about Terminator, they think about robots stealing jobs. And the interesting thing about the heavy equipment industry um, is that, you know, nobody wants to go back to the way things were done 150 years ago, where, you know, we're using horses and wheelbarrows and shovels and picks in order to actually move dirt, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's an industry that really depends on having advanced machinery and advanced technology. And so we just, you know, we think that automation is just kind of the next step in that evolution of the industry. Mm -hmm. um, something that we talk a lot about with the industry as well. Yeah, yeah, we follow the same route also at Dusty. Um, our customers are rightfully concerned that robots are going to take their jobs, right? And so there's, um, we have to be careful about are we building a robot or are we building a tool, a power tool? And in fact, we call our product a field printer. It's an appliance. Mm -hmm. It's like a printer. You know, it, it, it uses a lot of robotic technology. It uses sensors and path planning and AI and all that stuff that power robots today. But the branding and the marketing is really around the functionality. No one wants to buy a robot. Yeah. They want to solve their problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we've been, it's interesting as a mobility solution, some people have spurred, started spot, uh, calling Spot a vehicle, which is interesting. But I mean, we've been approaching it as you, you start with this, this thing, this object in the world, that, and you layer sensing on top of it. So you start with things like proprioception and balance. Um, but what's been cool about moving into construction is it's added this other layer of kind of knowing where that robot is within a space and being able to kind of track its location in that space. So by adding the additional sensing with LiDAR scanning and other optical forms, um, and then the ability to even tie that downstream into designers um, building information models um, shows like an interesting new approach for us. Mm -hmm. Do you feel like uh, for Boston Dynamics, the, the challenges associated with a construction site are really where you're able to highlight you know, where your technology is more advanced than others? I guess just not as much a closed loop system. There's a lot of unpredictability on a construction site, it seems. Yeah, and of course it totally depends on what the application is, but full disclosure, I was a customer before I joined Boston Dynamics at my last job, and it was the only robot that could go anywhere I could go on a construction site. Um, if you've ever been there, there are things to step over. Uh, the ability to navigate stairs is obviously really important, and then with the arm coming out to customers later, the ability to open doors. Um, mm -hmm. So we want to enhance that autonomy because that's what builds the ROI argument on site, but we also have to do a really good job of dealing with a changing environment. A lot of current SLAM technologies depend on moving around a static environment as regards feature recognition, but with a construction site, practically nothing mm -hmm. is static. So how we're able to maintain autonomous behavior over you know, up to years of a construction site, that's where the real challenge lies. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. For us at Toggle, this is also a big question, the complexity on the construction site. And, and it actually caused us to ask the question, you know, can we take some of the complexity actually off of the construction site? And so being in a prefab you know, business, that's really a big part of the, you know, the value proposition is that we can reduce complexity on site by doing some of the work ahead of time in a, you know, in a different environment. Mm -hmm. Do you guys go to kind of efforts to have your customers maybe limit the amount of unnecessary kind of uh, construction worker robotic interaction? I mean, we, we pride ourselves on going into human purposed environments. So we try to be really realistic about what we're able to control. So we go in knowing that it's going to be full chaos, um, which I think is a different approach than traditional automation, like in a factory or a warehouse where you would redesign the environment around the automation. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think the reality of construction is that you can't control the environment to a degree that you could in a factory or, or one of the more structured environments. And part of the challenge in robotics is figuring out how do you deal with that? Mm -hmm. How do you deal with people you know, interfering with your robot as it's doing its job? Yeah. Yeah, I guess with you know a Roomba kind of bumping into something and then finding a new path, <coughs> uh, with something like a, you know printing a blueprint on a construction site, like how smart do you need? What's like the minimum viable smartness of some of these products, and do you have to handle all of those uh, parts of the platform yourself, or do you look to other parties? That's what we're... Well, I think a lot of it also comes down to you know how you introduce robotics into the environment where people are working. Mm -hmm. And you know, like some folks have said, these are, you know, these are also tools. And safety and tools have been a big part of construction for a very long time. And so I think there's already this culture of safety and thinking about the way you're interacting with heavy equipment, sure. which is really you know, a fundamental first step before you even think about like, how can the systems respond to their environment. It's really about the people first. Mm -hmm. Yeah, does, does built robotics do your uh, kind of solutions, are they working amongst construction worker humans? No, yeah, so we've taken a pretty firm stance that we want the robots to work where the robots are and have the people work where only people are. Okay. Um, and, you know, queuing off what Dan said, that's actually just the best practice in the construction industry. Yeah. Um, generally, you want 30 feet between any pedestrian and any piece of heavy equipment. Mm -hmm. um, in certain circumstances, you can't do that because maybe you have a grade checker who jumps in a hole while a bucket's actually actively digging. Um, but that's, you know, that's a dangerous job. It's, sure. it's more, you know, it's, we're trying to help uh, make it so that people don't need to do that kind of job. What, um, yeah, go ahead. what, what have you all learned just from having you know, these devices in the field with actual people? You know, they're a little bit more unpredictable than you had planned beforehand. Like, what are kind of some of the contingencies that you've built in? Like, maybe run through some of those. So I've, I've been in robotics for, <clears throat> I guess, almost nine years at this point. Mm -hmm. And one of the lessons there is that any robot that's operating in a human environment has to uh, have self-preservation skills. And uh, as designers, we're responsible for building those into our robots. And one of the ways we do that is by making them cute. Uh, so just a small example, we put googly eyes on our last robot just for fun. But you know, it's going out into this really uh, very challenging environment uh, with people that don't necessarily want it to be there. Mm -hmm. And so how do we make people want, to, want it to be successful and uh, help it along rather than hindering it and trying to fight it? And so one of those ways is to make it beloved by the people that are using it. Hmm. Is that an issue with Spot? Because I would imagine that there, is it a loss of productivity if a lot of people are like, you know, checking out their little robot dog that's helping build something? Yeah, I mean, you'd be surprised by how quickly that wears off if Spot is doing something useful, okay. um, which has been really nice to see. I've, I've been pleasantly surprised, too, by how much um, customers kind of take ownership and care for Spot as, as something that's important to them, getting their day-to-day -day work done, almost to a fault. Um, the other day, Spot was trying to regain its balance, which it's perfectly capable of doing on its own, and the customer kind of reached in <laughs> to to try to save Spot, and I'm like, I assure you that, that Spot, yeah, Spot will fall down and get itself back up. You don't, mm -hmm. you don't need to reach in there. So there's, there's a lot in terms of um, how to kind of build on that positive relationship, but then also how to build off of prior con ops in terms of safety and operation to make sure it's a successful and safe endeavor for everyone. Mm -hmm. So Boston Dynamics, I guess, is looking at kind of a mobility platform for construction do you all think that there's going to be kind of a domineering uh, platform for all robotics, uh, construction robotics to operate on, or do you think it's going to be more purpose-built? I don't think that, that there's going to be a dominant one at all. I mean, mm -hmm. construction is such a diverse activity. You know, there are certain things like what NOAA does, which absolutely have to be done on site. And then mm -hmm. there are other tasks that can be moved off site. And so you need all of these different modalities to, you know, address, you know, myriad challenges. And I think, you know, it's, it's one of those things where all of the different systems are going to have uses and applications and bring value to, to the problems that are at hand. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I totally agree. And, you know, if you look at the state of the industry today, you typically have different firms, you know, that focus on different trades, different subcontractors, um, different tools, you know, just different processes. So it's actually really complicated, you know, building. Yeah. You know, this building, for example, it just takes thousands of people in order to pull it off. And I think the idea of trying to, trying to create one platform, uh, one, one robotic platform is, I mean, it'd be cool, but I think it'd be really, really hard. 
Yeah, I think last time I checked, there are like 78 different building trades or something like that. Mm. And, you know, I've been on projects with thousands of people and every single person is doing something slightly different. Mm. You know, the human form is very adaptable. We're, we can, we, we've adapted really well to be able to do a lot of these different tasks and building one robot that can do all of those things is really challenging. So why start there? You should have a different opinion. No, I mean, <laughs> yeah, we're, we're obviously building a, a platform that, that we hope will take a very good chunk of the market. But um, I think it's going to take all these types of robots and more, and furthermore, that they're going to have to be able to work together and network in more intelligent ways to distribute tasks. So we actually just released a YouTube video this morning, coincidentally, uh, with our logistics robot handle working with an auto AMR. Um, and I think those are really important steps to take to actually extend the value chain into these environments. And is that a necessary near-term position just because of how fractured the market is? Or do you actually think that that's going to be the case long-term? Yeah, the fact that there aren't that many players right now makes right. it easy to say that. Um, I think long-term, there will be enough people in the markets that there will be more competition. But ultimately, it's the same way we use lots of different people and lots of different machines on sites now to do these things. It's, I, I do believe that there will be multiple morphologies on construction sites and that it will be necessary for them to work together. Mm -hmm. Now, on this stage, uh, you all don't have the benefits necessarily of a Google or a SoftBank behind you, but uh, what do you think that the general kind of investment um, you know, opportunity around construction robotics looks like? Has it been easy to raise? Has it been you know, as expected? Like, how's that process been for, as a startup? I wouldn't say that it's ever easy to raise. Sure. Um, and if it is, then you're probably lowballing your valuation. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it should be a challenge. But I think that when we've been in market, uh, investors have been really excited to find applications of autonomy and ML that actually have short-term ROI. And by short-term, I mean it could still take a few years, but that's still better than the potentially unbounded amount of time that it mm -hmm. may take to you know, create like the, the, I think Willow Garage originally wanted to make a robot that could clean your house. And you know, who knows if that's gonna even happen in the next decade, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's definitely appealing. And I think for us in particular, because our, our technology installs on off the shelf equipment, mm -hmm. we get compared to self-driving cars a lot. And if, you know, we're actually already in market, we're generating revenue. Um, uh, and, you know, customers are, they're already sort of adapting the workflows to take advantage of our robots, which is pretty cool. It's, you know, I think in many ways we're further along than a lot of the larger self-driving car companies. So I think that's created a lot of excitement for robotics and construction robotics in particular. As a quick side note, is there, I was thinking this backstage, is there such thing as a level five construction robot or does that not exist? I think level, those levels are picked by the SAE, I think. So it's more focused on, you know, on-road vehicles. Um, but I guess you could take the same kind of approach and say, hey, you know, we want this construction robot to be able to do anything that a human can do. Mm. Um, and my take on that is that that's probably an AI complete challenge. Um, you know, in order to create a robot that's as smart as a person in some domain, you really just need that ro robot to be as smart as a person, in mm -hmm. which case, you know, you know, the singularity is here. Okay. Um, <laughs> so, you know, that's not how we think about it. We really focus on kind of like how Tesla was saying. We think of autonomous vehicles, um, autonomous construction vehicles as just being tools on the job site. Um, so what, what level they are isn't necessarily as important. It's just it's a tool in the hands of a skilled operator, and it can help that operator be more productive. Mm -hmm. So I guess back to the funding conversation. I think investors have definitely you know, clearly recognized how large the construction opportunity is. You know, it, it is one of those uh, industries that is, you know, it, it's, it's literally all around you, and as I mentioned before, urbanization is just driving you know, a massive uptick in construction, so I think that's very exciting and is, and is giving a lot of momentum to uh, construction tech, but you know, there are a lot of challenges because it's, a, you know, it's very much a hardware business, and it's, and it's not only hardware, but it's in you know, the real world in, in difficult conditions, so I think that um, you know, the expectations have to be around um, more capital intensity, especially if you're dealing with materials like we are. Mm -hmm. um, at, um, so you know, there, there are definitely challenges challenges that go along with the, the sheer size of the opportunity that investors are looking at. Mm -hmm. So I think the robotics industry has gone through a couple different phases. And uh, what, what was challenging is that the first wave of robotics companies, like coming out of Willow Garage, were these uh, robots that didn't have clear value props. I mean, they're, they're novelties. They're like cool, like, you know, they're roboticists wanting to build something that uh, no one really wanted to use. 
And uh, so, you know, I, I founded one of those companies. So um, the, the reality is that what we're seeing now is, is a renewed focus on robots that actually do useful work. And um, so I think VCs are paying attention to that, you know, where the fact that, you know, all of us are up here is kind of testament to the fact that, that we're, we're part of this wave. Mm -hmm. But what I am seeing in the VC community is uh, construction is definitely outside their comfort zone. Okay. Um, there are so many people in the construction industry, but that does not necessarily overlap with the, the, the networks of VCs, and that makes it very hard for them to evaluate our business. You know, all of us have spent a long time figuring out this industry, and we're now pros. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I would encourage any VCs in the audience who are listening to this, uh, the people are out there, they're willing to talk to you, it's an amazing industry, but you have to learn about it before, you, before you're comfortable. Yeah, I guess I'm, I'm curious because it seems like, you know, if you're investing in a warehouse robotics company, it's a little bit more of a closed loop situation for the company at hand and you don't have to deal with, you know, the bureaucracy abroad for just the construction industry. Like, has that been a challenge, kind of convincing people to, you know, educate themselves about that? Absolutely. I mean, that's why I was hired at Boston Dynamics. They wanted somebody from the construction industry. And as a construction researcher working with lots of robotics companies, um, there's a huge difference between um, performing automation in a, in a sub-trade versus performing automation that would be utilized by a general contractor versus automation that might be controlled by a building property owner. And those distinctions aren't always clear, and those incentives are certainly not aligned mm -hmm. um, necessarily. So that's something that anyone going into that space needs to be aware of when they're making a business plan. On the bureaucratic side, how's, how's the kind of regulatory environment for what you guys are building? Do you have to have it, you know, uh, pre-approved or it, like, what does that look like device, you know, certification wise? Uh, well, for us at Toggle, um, a little bit easier you know, it's, it is a yeah. little bit easier because we're providing a well-defined, you know, construction material rebar, which mm -hmm. has clear standards around it. Um, and, you know, the engineering is done by engineers, by structural engineers. And so um, we're in sort of a built to order type of situation, which sure. is great. Um, I think when we begin to push into, you know, the upstream design process, that's when it'll start to open up some new questions about, you know, how are we proposing to change the way construction, you know, the physical product itself is built. Yeah. And uh, for like safety guidelines for build, like, you know, is there anything you have to meet or is it all a little bit self-imposed and you're just going by kind of industry standards of how it would it go? Yeah, that's kind of the state of the industry today where we're all trying to, you know, be triple check everything and make sure that we're moving as safely as quickly or as safely as possible. Um, you know, and for us in particular, we have a three layer safety system. So the first is that there is a safety perimeter. Um, and the robot stays on one side and the people stay on the other, just like a WL line, um, you know, down the middle of a road. And then we have an e-stop, a wireless e-stop and a hard hardwired e-stop so that anybody who's near the robot can turn it off. And then lastly, we have LiDAR and, and computer vision uh, perception systems so that the robot can observe its environment and then obviously stop. Um, so it's something we think a ton, a lot, a ton about. Um, and uh, there's some ISO standards that, you know, we queue off of for sure. But the cool thing that I think Dan mentioned is this is an industry where the customer actually gives you the specs. So, you know, they tell you exactly what your rebarkation needs to look like. They tell us exactly what this foundation needs to look like. You know, mm -hmm. the tolerances, the dimensions, the center pin, you know, the everything. And just making it, that, that's, that's great from an engineering standpoint. So mm -hmm. there's a lot of clarity. And, and the, a lot of the bureaucracy, I think, happens before those specs are generated. So that, you know, for us, I don't think we necessarily see quite as much of it. Gotcha. Yeah, I mean, in terms of working on a job site, one of the... Uh, one of the challenges for mobile robotics companies is making their system safe enough so that you don't injure the people who are around the device. But the cool thing about what we're building on construction sites is that, you know, we've got this little Roomba-sized robot, and everyone around us is wearing steel-toed boots, and they're dealing with, like, much bigger equipment than what we're bringing onto the site. And so, you know, they kind of just ignore us because they're like, well, I'll just kick it out of the way if it, you know, becomes a problem. <laughs> and so it hasn't been an issue, which is fantastic for a young startup. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think there's the obvious advantage of the ability to place robots in environments that are hazardous to people. Um, and, but I think more interestingly is that robotics make all processes explicit. So when you sit down with a customer and you kind of go over training and operation and safety, um, what you actually realize is that we're not trying to do anything that's not already fairly well covered by OSHA in terms of governing safety on construction sites. Yeah. It just makes it very explicit while you're doing that and actually reinforces 
existing safety practices, mm -hmm. uh, which I think is a really positive thing. Have you had to, has Boston Dynamics had to kind of like turn down any potential customers just because, you know, the individual qualities of the job site, you just don't want them, you know, you think it might be unsafe to have an autonomous robot on it? I mean, it would certainly be alarming if we saw that people weren't following um, safety regulations. We have fortunately not had to deal with that. But yeah, we're, we're very serious about safety. So um, we always go over that first and foremost. I mean, before the robot would be powered on, we would have had those conversations several times. I guess in terms of like robot specific problems, like what are the biggest barriers to, you know, onboarding new customers, like questions they have that you might just kind of, you know, immediately know the answer to, but it's like a, a you know, a big stumbling block for them. I, I want to actually answer that and sure. follow up with what Brian just said, because I thought that was a really good point. Um, as we're learning more about this space, one of the things that I'm realizing is that the value that our robots are bringing is that we are regularizing what is normally done by people. And uh, because robots are autonomous and they have a fixed uh, set of actions that they'll do in a fixed order, um, they're taking this process that normally involves human judgment and human uh, creativity, and they're turning it into something the machine can do. And that, it can't be done by the robot itself, it has to be done by our customers regularizing their process to make it amenable to robotic automation, but that in turn makes better outcomes for the entire industry as a whole, because as soon as you get rid of all of that human judgment, you also get rid of the mistakes and the errors and the rework and the costs that happen when people mess up. Mm -hmm. And so that's like a huge thing that our customers are finding as they're figuring out how robots are going to impact their process. Mm -hmm. So on the question of barriers, we've got a couple minutes left. I guess what, what are kind of, you know, the, yeah, just the, kind of the questions that you're getting from some of your customers that you're having to allay their fears on? We have sort of a unique situation, and, and maybe other folks have encountered this, where, you know, for, for all of us probably up here, we're very excited to go to work in a robotics company, and robotics mm -hmm. is, you know, something really special. But for our customers, you know, they're, they're construction companies, and yeah. they have a different objective. They have to get the job done, you know, on time, on budget, safely. And so, you know, surprisingly or not, you know, a lot of them actually aren't that interested in the robotics. They want to know, you know, is your product going to be better, faster, or cheaper? Mm -hmm. And if so, great. If not, you know, next. So yeah. it's, it's actually been less of a conversation than, than we would have anticipated. Is that the case for on-site stuff also? I think so. And I think that the bigger challenge that we encounter sometimes is just the same challenge any startup folk, uh, faces when they're dealing with a much larger enterprise. So mm -hmm. you know, some companies that we work with are, you know, they employ thousands or even tens of thousands of people. And, so, and we have you know, 30. So it's just yeah. that kind of impedance mismatch. Mm -hmm. But uh, generally, folks in construction are very pragmatic. Mm -hmm. And if you tell them, hey, you know, we can deliver this much production for you, and it's a little bit faster, a little bit cheaper, um, people get excited. I love the construction industry for that reason. It's just, there's no bullshit. It, excuse me. Uh, it, they, you know, if it works, and it's better, faster, cheaper, and it saves them time or it saves them money, then there's a market. And it's really easy to figure that out for a startup perspective. You know what you're building and why. And you're not getting drawn into uh, novelty factors or things that don't really put, move the needle. Sure. Yeah, I think, I think the kind of ROI of the task or the hypothesis of the value add to the task itself being automated has been a pretty easy conversation to have. Um, so now it's questions of how to extend that value both upstream and downstream. There's a lot of interest in integration into building information modeling, integration into existing globally accurate surveying methods. Um, so anyone who's familiar with, with SLAM knows the challenges inherent to that, to take a robot map and superimpose that on a kind of statically laser scanned survey grade map. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that's where we'll be headed next. So extending that from end to end. Great. Well, it looks like we've run out of time. I just want to thank all of you so much for getting on stage and sharing a bit about your companies. Um, but thanks. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you.